Good morning, everyone. My name is Rich Sloma. Welcome to today's New York State Archives presentation of Managing Your Records Management and Archives Projects. Today's presenters are Maria McCashin, John Diefenderfer, and Karen Robatin. This session is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box to the right side of your screen and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Please do not type your question into the Q&A tab since we are not using this feature. And now I will turn the presentation over to Maria. Thank you, Rich. Good morning and welcome everyone to the webinar. As Rich just mentioned, um, my name is Maria McCashin and I'm here with John Diefenderfer from doc the Documentary Heritage Program and Karen Robotin from State Agency Scheduling Services for all different units of the State Archives. And I'm going to turn it over to John for a moment uh, to talk a little bit about Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services of New York State. Thanks, Maria. Um, DIPSNY, as we like to call it, is a collaboration between the New York State Archives and the New York State Library with services provided by the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. DIPSNY is a statewide program that provides free planning and education services to support the vast network of collecting institutions such as archives, libraries, historical societies, museums, and other organizations that safeguard and ensure access to New York's historical records and library research materials. DIPSNY services include archival needs assessments, preservation and condition surveys, strategic planning assistance, and access to a variety of educational programs such as this webinar. To learn more about our services, uh, please visit dipsney.org and I'll drop that link in the chat. And um, I think this is officially the first joint webinar between government record services and the documentary heritage and preservation services. So thank you all for being a part of this historic moment. So back to you, Maria. Thanks, John. Let's jump right into our objectives today. Okay, so Karen, John, and I will be presenting key considerations for project for managing records management and archives projects. And we'll apply those key considerations to an imaging project. Karen will begin by discussing some project management basics followed by John will discuss project planning, and then I'll discuss management steps beyond planning. And as Rich mentioned, please feel free to type questions in the chat box. We've reserved time at the end for questions. And before Karen gets started, I just wanna point out that this webinar will be an overview. On the slide are more detailed resources to assist you including the Project Management Body of Knowledge, which is a publication from the Project Management Institute, and Karen will be referring to that. Also, the State Archives has a publication on managing imaging projects that details the steps involved with managing a project and also includes sample tools such as an imaging information form and sample uh, specifications and a sample contract. In addition, the digital imaging guidelines, which provide industry standards for creating digital images. The digital imaging guidelines are required for state agencies, local governments, and any organization using State Archives grant funds for a project involving imaging. In addition, the Documentary Heritage Program and the Local Government Records Management Improvement Fund grant application guidelines can be used. And whether you apply for a grant or not, the guidelines include narrative questions that can help you describe and frame a project. The regulations of the Commissioner of Education are requirements that state agencies and local governments must follow for the retention and preservation of electronic records. And those, that includes digital images. These include criteria that must be followed for preserving permanent electronic records, things like maintaining documentation on the systems and software, uh, the systems and the records involved, having remote backups, 
and also having a migration plan. And then New York State Information Technology Services has a toolkit that provides guidance on appropriate storage for electronic records. And we also have webinars. The State Archives has dozens of recorded webinars on all kinds of records management and archives topics, both on their website and their YouTube page. And here are four that are related to today's content. So now I'm going to pass the presentation ball on to Karen and she'll get us started with some basics. Thanks, Maria. Hello, everyone, and welcome again. I'm Karen Robotin. Uh, in this part of the presentation, I'll be describing characteristics that define a project and then discussing key elements of managing a project with project management methodologies. There may be some of you thinking, but I'm not a project manager. Well, fortunately, you don't need to be a certified project manager to lead records management or archival projects effectively. Many of you may have managed some kind of project before and gained some experience. Uh, to a certain degree, you may already be a project manager, but don't think of your responsibilities in that context. Even if you don't have any previous experience, we'll provide an overview of project management principles so you can manage projects and ultimately achieve successful outcomes. Hopefully you'll find you can use project management skills in your day-to-day -day jobs as well, uh, whether you're in charge of a team or just a task. Project versus a process. Let's first define a project. PMI, or the Project Management Institute, which is an association uh, recognized as the authority for project management professionals, says a project is a temporary endeavor with a definite, <clears throat> excuse me, beginning and end. So let's look further at some properties of a project and then consider how a project differs from a process or a more routine task. A project improves a program or fills a void. This need could be identified internally or it may result from requests outside of your program like a customer. A project has a defined lifespan, a clear start and end date. This is important uh, to note because um, there is a finish line. The project could be shorter and last maybe a month, or it could be long and last years, but it does end. It can't continue indefinitely. Generally, a project involves something new. It requires resources such as time, people, and money. And a project brings added value or benefit to your program. Although you should note that the benefit may not be experienced right away. How does a project differ from a process? Well, a process is considered to be standard tasks and activities. This means work that's repeated on a daily or routine basis. This is work or task completed during the course of normal business operations. Once defined, the work associated with a process is similar within different areas of the organization. And in a process, similar principles apply whether you're a small or large organization. Some examples may be for projects, 
uh, implementing a new information management system or employing conservation measures for a new complex collection. A few process examples could be uh, disposing of inactive administrative records at the end of their retention period or completing an accessioning form. These examples are uh, relatively at opposite ends um, of a scale if you created a project versus process scale. The project uh, examples are complex and, and require significant time to complete. Um, and there can be a fairly large gray area in between projects and standard tasks. Then where does a process cross over to a project? There isn't a hard line. Um, how can you determine whether work meets a minimum threshold to be classified as a project and you want to be using project management methodology? Uh, well, I have a, a reasonable starting point. Um, if you can answer yes to the following questions, does the work involve more than 10 tasks? Will the work involve more than two people? And will the work require more than three weeks to be completed? Now, I've seen a number of variations on this online. So remember, though, this is only a guideline and whether work is assigned as a project is something you and your, your organization uh, will need to determine what makes sense. Why project management? What are some of the what are some of the advantages? Well, it saves time and money. We can have increased work productivity and efficiency. Uh, improves internal communications and collaboration. It empowers you to make data driven decisions enables you to scale and repeat your successes for small and large projects, fosters greater alignment across teams, stakeholders, and clients, keeping all the players on the same track with the same goal. Facilitates better risk management, which is minimizing all the things that could go wrong with a project, basically by evaluating the risks early on and helps you optimize your workflows for smoother processes. Overall, the main benefit is project management can provide a roadmap for success. These are considered the essentials of project management. Uh, the five steps or phases are initiation, planning, execution, monitoring and controlling, and closing. And we'll take a closer look at each of these steps. First is project initiation. We're beginning with the idea or element identified as missing from a program. And in order for the idea to become a project, it needs to provide some benefit. You'll need to identify who will be affected by the project or the stakeholders. And the project scope must be defined, which is what will be accomplished as part of the project and what will be excluded. And finally, approvals for the project from all the stakeholders. Initiation is actually the most important of the five steps. Uh, without clear controlled expectations, the project is likely to not stay on track or have a successful outcome. The next step is planning. So we start with documenting the plan and task list. 
with where we need to ensure all the tasks are listed, establish the flow uh, or order of the tasks, develop a time and cost estimate, including staff for the project team, equipment supplies, and so on, create a schedule, document procedures to follow, refine outcome or requirements, and decide how you want to communicate. And some examples of that are email, uh, regular meetings, stand-up meetings, written reports, website posts, and also uh, the expected frequency of communications. So this is just a quote to serve as a reminder that planning is essential. Uh, from Winston Churchill, who said, those who plan do better than those who do not plan, even though they rarely stick to their plan. The next step is project execution. Um, at this phase, we'll, you'll be assembling the project team. Uh, you should hold a kickoff meeting to begin the project. And this lets everyone involved with the project know the planning phase has ended and the project is officially underway. The work will begin and uh, the team will follow the plan. And lastly, modify or enhance the plan when necessary. Uh, it's unlikely that a project uh, would go from beginning to end uh, without some minor changes needing to take place. Uh, for example, circumstances such as having an inexperienced team, the project itself having a lot of unknowns, um, additional requirements surfacing um, as the project goes on are just some of those examples. The next step uh, is monitoring and controlling. And uh, for this step, communicating regularly, uh, especially as the project manager to all those uh, affected, the team and the stakeholders. Uh, you'll monitor the work progress and the costs. Um, if the project is not proceeding as expected, uh, modifications uh, will need to be made to the plan. And the key here is to know when to make those modifications, not too soon um, and also uh, not too late. The most common issues um, encountered are the project running late or the project being over budget. So the key is to make the modifications necessary uh, to achieve a, a su successful outcome, but with the least negative impact on the, on the overall project. And finally, um, scope change control. Um, it's important that once the scope uh, is defined way back in the um, initiation step that, um, it's the changes are limited then to the scope um, when possible. And lastly, uh, we have the project closing. Uh, in this phase, you would want to evaluate your task list, task list. Um, that all the work is complete. Then you want to confirm with management and customers that the work is complete. Uh, you would want to conduct a post project review with the team's assessment of the outcome. And this would entail uh, discussing what went well, what didn't go well, uh, were there any parts missing, 
Uh, also, uh, the team should assess what variables, good and bad, contributed uh, to the actual outcome, and uh, especially where the goals of the project met. Um, an added note for the post uh, project review is um, too often project success is measured with time and budget results, uh, but quality of the end product is also key. And this is an important factor when answering the question, were the goals of the project met? And lastly, uh, we uh, we need to document the results. Uh, it's important um, as part of this uh, step that you com uh, compile all the lessons learned so that uh, those lessons can be used while, when planning future projects. Uh, one final um, comment that I'd like to make is um, that the emphasis um, was placed more on the mechanics of project management, um, completing the tasks on schedule and on budget um, in this uh, you know, limited time. But it's important uh, to remember that leading people and leading the team is equally as important uh, to achieving a successful project outcome. So I'm going to pass the baton now to John. Thanks for your attention. All right, thanks, Karen. Um, just gotta wait until I'm the host. Okay, great. Looks like I'm the host now. So um, what I'm gonna focus on for this portion of the webinar is transitioning from a needs assessment to a project plan. Um, you can, you know, whether or not that's an internal needs assessment or if you've received an archival needs assessment from Dipsney, um, the needs assessment is really gonna be focused on outcomes. Um, it's gonna identify um, areas for improvement and say, in order to improve, you need to do X, but it's not gonna give you a lot of guidance as to how to do X. And that's where a project plan really comes in because the project plan focuses on the means of it, of, of obtaining those or attaining those outcomes um, and what steps and resources are required to attain that goal. Um, and part of that involves de developing a project plan. So here are the sort of general elements of a, a basic project plan. And I'll walk through these and give you examples um, using the um, imaging project or digitization project um, as, as an example. So we'll start with the, the scope. Um, the scope is a statement of what work is included in the project. And also it's important to include what's not going to be part of the project. So for example, for this imaging project, you're gonna scan the board minutes from 1852 to 1992. Um, gives you a sense of why you're doing it because they're brittle um, and will reduce handling. Um, and it also says that the minutes from 1993 to the present were created digitally and don't need to be converted to electronic format. So it gives you a sense of what's what's involved in the project and what isn't. Next, you plan your schedule. What are the steps that you need to be that you need to take in order to obtain the goal that you've uh, identified? Um, and they're broken into individual tasks with a defined beginning and end. Um, again, this is probably something that as you begin to implement will be flexible, but it's good to um, have this as part of your, it's essential to have this as part of your plan. Next is the resources. These are the materials, stuff, staff um, needed to obtain, uh, attain your goal um, that you've defined in your scope. And these can either be purchased or in-house um, materials that you have on hand. So for example, um, for your imaging project, um, you're gonna need to um, box up the materials and ship them to a vendor who will provide you with um, 
images on a hard drive that you will need to supply, and then you will need network storage um, in order to store those materials once they're scanned. Um, next up in the project plan is the budget, and this is a, a statement of the individual project expenses and the total cost of the project. And this is the cost of material and equipment that you identified in the resources section of the plan. Um, the example on the um, right hand side here is, you know, the budget categories that we use for um, our grant programs here at the state archives. Um, the requirements. Um, this is the statement of the conditions or capability that is required to achieve the goal that you've identified and laid out in your scope. Um, so, for example, in order to scan these hypothetical minutes, you need to remove all fasteners before they go to the vendor, or in order to ship them, they need to be arranged chronologically in folders and placed in standard record boxes to be sent to the vendor. Um, you need to identify as part of your project plan the stakeholders, and a stakeholder is pretty much anyone that has an interest in this project. Um, for example, the board of directors or the town board um, would have continued access to these fragile materials. Um, your archival staff would um, not have to handle these materials as frequently, so they'd be better preserved. And researchers would have improved access to the content in, in the form of searchable scanned minutes. So it's important to not only identify who's interested, but how they're interested and what their interest in the project is. <clears throat> um, and quality criteria, this is the standards that need to be met in order for um, the project to succeed. And um, as part of your quality criteria, you should include sort of pass fail requirements um, and how you're going to assess those. Um, so, for example, your metadata that you're requesting from the vendor will be qualified Dublin Core. Um, vendor will supply the data and archive staff will ins inspect the metadata before it's loaded into a management system. Next um, up as part of your project plan is risk management. Um, this is a statement of what could uh, prevent your project from succeeding. Um, and um, what can be done to reduce the potential for those ri risks to um, derail your project. Um, so you want to identify both the probability and the severity. Um, for example, the images don't meet the imaging guidelines. Um, so it's unlikely the severity would be high because your project would fail entirely. Um, and ways to prevent that are provide imaging standards to the vendor and include those imaging standards um, in the RFP and written into the resulting contract. So once you have all these elements laid out, um, you have basically um, a really nice roadmap for a grant application, either for the Local Government Records Management Improvement Fund or the DHP. So you'd have all of these elements that would lay out clearly what you're trying to do, how you're going to do it, what it's going to cost, who's involved, how you're going to assess um, the success of the project, and what you're going to do to mitigate some of the risks associated with the project. Um, and I, I can say from grant review experience, if you come to a grant with a well-defined project plan, um, that will really uh, work in your favor, and reviewers really like to see this kind of um, well thought out, well reasoned plan in, in a grant application. Um, so having said that, um, I'm going to pass it along to Maria McCashin, who's going to walk us through what it looks like to implement a project plan for an imaging project. All righty, Maria, there you go. Thank you, John. So from this point, I'll cover management considerations after an imaging project has been approved. So once a project is approved, these are some key activities that must be managed. The development of a request for proposals to solicit imaging vendors, choosing a vendor and developing a contract, determining staffing needs, 
and then the actual project activities. Some may be done by a vendor. Um, all of them may be done in-house or it may be a combination of the two. These include preparing records for scanning, scanning and indexing the records, quality control and content verification, and image transfer. The project should also include a plan to preserve the information. This aspect of the project will likely be coordinated with your IT staff or a vendor, and it requires a commitment to maintain a system that's capable of providing access to your images for as long as required. This will also involve your organization budgeting funds for annual maintenance, support, and periodic hardware, software, and format upgrades. Okay, so you may need to prepare a request for proposals. And this slide lists key information from the project plan that John mentioned to incorporate into a request for proposal. So on the left are some examples of requirements and on the right are some examples of those requirements. So even if your project doesn't require an RFP, this type of information and any additional requirements for your project should be prepared and provided to an imaging vendor or in-house staff to follow. This will ensure consistency and compliance with any required standards. I mentioned the State Archives Managing Imaging Projects publication. It has an imaging information form and also a sample specification for imaging and that'll help you collect data on records planned for imaging. In addition, the digital imaging guidelines includes a list of recommended information and also the standards for image creation. If you do work with a vendor, they should also be able to inspect the records intended for imaging. So if they can actually see the records, they can often provide additional insights related to imaging or indexing and you can add those to your requirements as well. You'll also choose a vendor. And this slide contains information to help you not only evaluate the vendors, but also evaluate vendor facilities. So on the left-hand side, there are some questions that you can use to help select a vendor. And it can be helpful to um, send out your RFP, receive your proposals, and add any additional questions um, all via email, and that can help you manage the responses coming in from all the vendors. So you would wanna know how many years of experience they have, what types of projects they've done, whether or not they've done and have references for any projects that are similar to your project, and also whether or not their price quote matches your requirements. You should visit the vendor's facilities, and you want to do that before you sign the contract. You want to see what the facilities are like, whether they're secure or protected. Are the staff knowledgeable, and are they careful with the records that they're imaging? Also, what quality controls are in place at the vendor's level? <clears throat> and what the turnaround time is, um, because you may have a limited project time frame. And how do they handle any errors? So you want to have all this information before you sign a contract with a vendor. I mentioned um, Managing Imaging Projects publication has a sample contract that you can use. So you can use that contract, or you may have one of your own. This is some additional information that you may want to include in a contract with an imaging vendor. So information about delivery dates for sending the records to the vendor and also when the records will be returned to you, as well as any instructions for packing, pick, pick up, or delivery. You want to address contract resolution and cancellation. So you want to make sure that there's a process for resolving any problems during the project and with the option for canceling the contract if necessary. You might want to include a no subcontracting clause so that the vendor does all the work itself at its own facility. And you may want to include 
a process for the images to be transferred by the vendor to your software or network or whatever system is intended for managing the images. So throughout the project, whether or not you work with a vendor, the same areas that John discussed for preparing the project plan must also be managed and may need adjustments throughout the project. So with the scope, you want to ensure that the project remains within the planned scope. Um, and if it does need to creep for any reason that you have a process in place for approving any changes. Same thing with the budget. You want to keep within the budget, but if it needs to change, you want to have a process for addressing those changes. You also want to anticipate the time needed to complete each work step and monitor that work and keep the work on track. You want to ensure that standards are followed. So these are things like ensuring that the format, resolution, indexing, storage, and other requirements are all met. And you want to address image quality and indexing accuracy by completing all quality control steps, including technical content and indexing quality control and having an option to test the images and indexes before calling the work complete. Really, that shouldn't be an option. You should make sure that gets done. Also, uh, finally, you want to ensure that your storage requirements are met. The project manager, as John and Karen mentioned, also must manage people involved in the project. So regular reports should be provided to the sponsors and the stakeholders and their expectations will need to be managed. So for example, the project manager should be able to use the original project plan documentation to remind sponsors why no additional record series will be part of the current imaging projects. Maybe they can be prioritized for the next project. Open communication should be maintained with the project team, including vendors, and periodic review points should be planned to ensure that the work stays on track within the project timeframes and on budget. And if you're working with a vendor, ideally, I've mentioned this, you should have them send sample images and indexing to test at the beginning of the project so that you can refine and adjust any issues as needed. And so there are no surprises at the end that you're not able to fix. You should also never assume that the vendor knows your deadlines. You should make sure that they're aware of any changes to your project timeline. If you do have deadlines that aren't flexible, these should be included in your contract. And even if they are in your contract, you should still check in with the vendor on a regular basis to ensure that their work is on track because the work doesn't end with the vendor. The project manager will also need to manage all the project activities. These will be the most time consuming part of an imaging project, so they should be planned well, particularly the work that's involved and the amount of time needed to complete it. They should also be monitored regularly to ensure that the work is on target and it produces the intended results. The project management may include sorting, pulling staples and clips, flattening, stabilizing, removing duplicates and other documents. This work is time consuming, manual labor. The state agency does provide a rate of a thousand sheets per hour for this type of work, but we do recommend doing a test with a portion of the records to help you provide a, the most accurate rate. Image capture, which is the time needed to scan the records, will depend on the records, their condition, and also the equipment you or the vendor are using. So for example, fragile or bound or oversized documents take longer to scan. The State Archives has no recommended rate for scanning. We do recommend that you do your own test or you provide a detailed description of the records to the vendor and also have them inspect the records themselves. Indexing may involve determining terms for index fields. 
or software to enable text searching like optical character recognition and or the creation of file names. So the indexing will depend on where the images will be stored, for example, in a database or on a network and the capabilities of the intended storage system. Quality control and content verification will include technical quality control, and this will likely be done by a vendor or the staff that are actually doing the scanning. And they'll spot check things like whether an image is skewed or flipped or has the wrong resolution. Content verification will be done by your staff, and it must involve a one-to-one -one comparison of the original record to the digital image if the intent is to destroy the original record. Some of you may be creating access copies and not destroying the original. However, this doesn't eliminate the need for content verification because ideally you want to scan once and create use copies that will be maintained a long time. And then finally, transferring images may happen during scanning or it may happen afterwards if the vendor creates the images. And how the images will be transferred by whom and when should be documented in your project plan. It should also be in your project specifications. And if it's the con uh, vendor is responsible for this, it should be part of your contract. As I mentioned, the State Archives has details on these project activities. Um, you'll find those in ma the Managing Imaging Projects publication. The Digital Imaging Guideline has guidelines has details on um, image creation. There are guidelines in the grant application guidelines for rates of work. And we also have information in the recorded webinars. And State Archives staff can assist you personally with any questions you have about planning these steps. Karen mentioned monitoring and controlling. Throughout your project, you should communicate regularly with project staff and vendors and monitor all project activities. The feedback that you get by doing this will enable you to identify and address any issues that come up as soon as possible. And then you can adjust your project as needed so that there are no surprises at the end or you're left with a product, product that's not what you anticipated. So again, be sure to test the images and the indexes before calling the work complete. And if you're working with a vendor, make sure you include enough time for reviewing the final product in the contract so that the contract doesn't end before the review process is complete. So at the close of the project, Karen mentioned this too, you should write a project assessment and it should answer questions like what was accomplished and how you solved the problem. Did you use your original plan or were there any deviations from the original plan? Also, what was the actual, the actual timeline for the project? What weren't you able to accomplish? Were there any lessons learned or best practices implemented that you can use down the road? And how will you maintain the results long-term? Documentation on the project outcome will remind you and others what was done, what wasn't done, what worked and what didn't, and it'll provide you with good information to help plan future projects. So to summarize today's webinar, a needs assessment will help you prioritize and plan a project. And if you don't have one, you may want to consider whether a needs assessment is a necessary first step. It's necessary to assign a project manager. So you want that person there to oversee the project planning and development, ensure that the project runs smoothly, is accomplished, and that it delivers what the project promised. The project manager should be um, monitoring all activities and maintaining regular communication with project staff and sponsors to manage expectations and, attract, uh, and to track any issues. And your project should be flexible enough to adjust and refine as needed. You should document project outcomes to archive that information and to help plan new projects and keep in touch with the State Archives for assistance and resources.
So we have left time at the end for questions. Thank you all for your attention. Rich, do we have questions? Yes, Maria, we have a couple. I just want to, first of all, we had some questions at the beginning about uh, getting the recording of the webinar, and uh, there's m many ways to do that. You can either go to the New York State Archives website, uh, clicking on the tab um, above for uh, workshops. Um, you can also go to the New York State Archives YouTube page. The best way to find that is just Google New York State Archives YouTube, and uh, within a week or so, we'll have the recording available. Or you can email us at arctrain at niced.gov per the instructions in this webinar, or you can go through the Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services website as well, or their contacts. Um, so questions. Yes, uh, first there's a comment from Megan. Uh, she remarked that uh, Project Management Body of Knowledge 6th edition is no longer available for download. She made that comment. Well, I'll just add that um, it's not available at the Project Management Institute, but if you Google P PMBOK 6th edition free, you will find other locations where it can be downloaded for free. Uh, one is um, Google um, Google Docs or Google Books, and um, there are a couple other locations, but you should be able to find a couple resources where it is free to download or you can simply use it online in those locations. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, also, uh, we had a um, question here from Catherine. Can you address the file output criteria? Do the documents need to be in the PDFA format? Well, I'll take that one again. Um, it would depend on the type of record and you can use the digital imaging guidelines to determine the appropriate formats for records that you are converting from paper to digital. Okay. Uh, if you're, if we're talking about minutes, um, PDF A is um, the archival version of a PDF and it would be appropriate an appropriate format for converting minutes. Okay, we had a question here from Griselda actually looking for some clarification regarding uh, the RFP process. Uh, I know we have to draft one for submission with our grant proposal. Do we make the RFP public prior to the grant award or are we doing this after the award is received? Uh, if prior, are we making it clear to the vendor that is selected as part of the RFP process that we will only go forward with the project if we are awarded the grant? Well, I'll take that one again. Um, so I brought up the R, well, well, we all brought up the RFP, but um, there are a variety of different people in attendance today. Some people will need to solicit multiple vendors, and in other words, bid for a vendor's services. For the purpose of a local government records management improvement fund grant, <clears throat> we ask you to create a request for quotes. So you get it, well, and it really, it may only be one quote, but you're essentially re listing those requirements, um, as I mentioned, project specifications, describing the, describing the records, um, all the requirements necessary for converting those records, the fact that somebody, the vendor should be following the digital imaging guidelines. You're putting that into your request for a quote that you submit to New York State Industries for the Disabled and then they assign a vendor who can do the project and then you meet with that vendor. So it's a little bit different for a local government records management improvement fund project, but for other projects, they may need to prepare a request for proposals and send those out to solicit multiple vendors in order to bid on those services. Okay, Maria, I'm gonna- so Did that answer your question about LGRMIF? Have to see if uh, Griselda comes back to that. Um, I should say another requirement of the LGRMIF project is that you have to attach that request for quotes or RFQ to your application. So essentially, we want to see that you understand and can present this information to a vendor, um, the requirements for your project, the description of the records that will be involved, all that information. Um, 
to show that you've planned your project well and you know the requirements that are necessary and you can convey that information to the vendor. And we're happy to help you and provide you with samples if you have any questions about doing that. Uh, yes, Griselda. Sorry to interrupt, yes. just jumping in here for DHP grants. We don't require the RFQ, but um, certainly laying out if you're proposing to use a vendor to digitize materials, um, laying out the specifications, the standards, um, and the types of records, et cetera, et cetera, um, that would typically be in an RFQ are all part of the DHB application itself. So, Okay, uh, we have a question here from Catherine. Uh, we have personally met with three to four vendors. Does that satisfy the RFP or must the vendor actually respond to an RFP? Well, I, I don't mind taking that one again. Um, you would you would want responses because um, you would want to be able to vet those responses, and then also ideally interview the the vendors, um, visit their facilities, like I mentioned, and make sure that um, they answer questions um, like they have at least five years of experience, that they've done projects like yours. Um, that they provided you with a price quote that matches your requirements, things like that. Okay, uh, Maria asks, uh, would you recommend that a copy of the digital imaging guidelines be sent to department heads or records designees to ensure that they are aware of what is expected when moving to a paperless record project? Well, I'm going to take that one again, and, and that's ideally the responsibility of the records management officer. So um, that would be that they would keep in touch with the state archives um, about standards and best practices for records management and archives projects, and that they would relay that information to others in the organization so that they're aware of it as well. So I would say yes to your question. Okay. and. Uh... Me Moy asked if it would be possible to get a PDF of this recording, and the answer to that is yes. Just uh, send us an email again to arctrain at nyshead.gov, uh, per the where the which is on the instructions to this email, and we'd be happy to send you a PDF of the recording, or rather, I should say, a PDF of the slides. If that's what you're looking for. Do that. Okay, let's see. Uh, got about uh, eight minutes left, and uh, I don't see any additional questions. So maybe we'll give folks a chance to. Uh, and I want to say too that before we hang up, say goodbye. If uh, there are any groups of people watching this video, so more than one. If there's say two, three, four, or more, if you could just type that number into the chat box, that would give us a good idea. Uh, of uh, how many uh, additional people may have been on. And uh, like I said, we still have about uh, seven minutes. Does anyone have any final comments before we uh, include Maria, Karen, or John? Well, I'll, I'd, I'll just comment that um, because there are a variety of um, people from different organizations in attendance. Um, we've provided you with some email addresses. The rec management email address um, is for questions related to government records and the documentary heritage services or DHS at NYSED for questions for nonprofit historical records repositories. Um, but doesn't matter which email address you use, uh, staff at the State Archives are happy to address your questions and um, we welcome your questions. So please uh, feel free to contact us anytime. We're happy to help you with your imaging projects or any projects that you're managing that relate to records management and archives. Down to just a couple more minutes. I don't see any additional questions.
Well, Maria, I guess at this point in time, since there are no any, oh, there's just one, uh, let's see, a new question just popped in. Are there any specific software programs for storage that you recommend? And this is from Barbara. Well, um, in the digital imaging guidelines, we do recommend an electronic content management system for storing digital records. I don't think we have a webinar on that yet, um, but um, we can provide you with information that on more information on electronic content management systems if you want to contact rec management at nyscd.gov. I don't see any other questions, Maria, so perhaps uh, we could probably uh, give folks back a few minutes. Okay. Thank you, Rich. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.